Thank you very much. It's so nice to be here. Uh, there's a lot to say, of course, about petitioning in the Soviet Union, and a number of themes have already come up. Uh, the first is the question of language. Uh, we use the term petition to um, just the process of petitioning really captures a number of uh, forms, t forms of correspondence. Uh, there's the simple letter, the pisma. Uh, there's the complaints, the jaloby. There's the what we translate as petitions, the zayavlenia. But there's also, you know, sometimes people wrote to Soviet power and just wrote prozba, a request on the top of their letter. So. All of these forms of correspondence uh, we, uh, I, I will discuss uh, under the general uh, rubric of uh, petition writing. Um, first, let me talk a little bit about um, the archives. Uh, when the archives opened, when Gorbachev began to declassify uh, documents and uh, and enable people to gain uh, access. And then once uh, the, the uh, post-Soviet uh, period uh, emerged and the archives flew wide open, those of us who were doing our dissertations at the time just uh, went straight in to see what was there. And one of the documents that really excited many of us were these letters. We had not seen these before. Uh, our advisors and others in the field had worked with, you know, formal government documents, uh, decrees and party speeches and so on. And now suddenly uh, we get the voices of uh, people who lived in the Soviet Union. So it was very exciting. Um, but. So, but the people who actually preserved many of these uh, letters didn't value them as much as we did. So while we find some of them in different archives, people wrote to Stalin, and in Stalin's personal archive there are letters, you know, people wrote to different uh, leaders uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, some of those are preserved, but not all. And there was this process in the Soviet Union where archivists would uh, winnow or weed out things or um, toss things out. And sadly, many of these letters uh, were not valued uh, by archivists and others and were lost. And one body of letters that I really wish we had um, are from uh, gulag prisoners uh, because they wrote many letters to Gulag authorities, uh, and those have been lost. Those were discarded in the Khrushchev years when the Gulag archive was uh, uh, reorganized. But the easy, so given this uh, lack of appreciation uh, for petitions among archivists and uh, Soviet authorities over the years, uh, some of the best the best place, I think, to often find these uh, letters are in personal case files. So criminal case files, uh, the cases of people who were disenfranchised, uh, that I, I wrote about them. They were called uh, the so-called licensi, people who were deprived of rights in the early revolutionary period. Uh, they were classified as class enemies. Uh, former czarist officials, people who engaged in private trade and were considered uh, bourgeois elements of some kind. Uh, those individuals uh, were stripped of rights and they went through a process of petitioning or appealing for rights. Hundreds of thousands of these petitions uh, are, reside in the case files of these disenfranchised people. So if you're looking for petitions, often criminal cases, criminal case files uh, are a good uh, place to find them in the archives. Uh, so let me go through uh, a li um, some of the, just the landscape of petitioning and petitions, starting with uh, the petitioners. Uh, there were many different types of petitioners, many occasions for writing. People wrote to uh, get their rights back, as I mentioned. Uh, people who were sentenced, this was a regime that uh, sentenced people continuously, and I'm looking also uh, at the Stalin period. Uh, people were not only um, sentenced for 
uh, various uh, de uh, deviant behavior, but in the war years, uh, there was a whole range of behavior that was criminalized. If you're late to work, if you uh, miss your miss a day of work, uh, that was it was almost like desertion. And so many people were sentenced for being late to work, for missing work during the war. Uh, and then uh, for theft of socialist property uh, resulted in uh, the uh, arrest and um, and the sentencing of uh, the majority of people in the gulag uh, by the late of 40s and early 50s. So uh, these were incredibly um, consequential criminal uh, laws, and they affected uh, millions of people. Many of them felt compelled to then write a petition, whether it was to Stalin, uh, to the local party leadership, to the courts, to the procuracy, uh, 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 asking that their uh, sentence be repealed or mi or uh, mitigated or or or, um, or just um, that they ha would have no criminal record um, because if you had a criminal record that affected your ability to find work so uh, one form of petition was to eliminate any record of uh, arrest. So people wrote to um, get criminal convictions annulled or removed, they, um, but they also wrote for very concrete uh, social rights, the right to a residency permit, the right to an education, the right to employment, housing, pension, medical care, uh, food provisions, uh, and so on. So citizenship in the early Soviet Union was tied not to rights of speech or um, your, your birthright. It was really about your class and your social origin. So even if you were a foreigner and you lived in the Soviet Union, if you were from the working class, you were c considered a citizen. Uh, but you could have lived in Russia your whole life, been a member of the bourgeoisie, and suddenly you found yourself uh, effectively stateless or rightless after the revolution. So those individuals uh, were stripped of the rights of work and housing and education, and they wrote to try to get those rights. Uh, they wrote Stalin, they wrote uh, to different um, uh, they were different state entities, party entities, um, and so on. Very few of these petitions were collective. People were deprived of rights as a collective, but they appealed for rights as individuals. Moreover, uh, the people who, want, who petitioned weren't those uh, for whom the ask was, uh, like, People sometimes petitioned for others. So a child would petition on behalf of their parents. Uh, a spouse would petition uh, on behalf of uh, a spouse. So uh, that was very common, that people petitioned on behalf uh, of others and uh, family members. And very often, those petitions were really effective. You know, when children wrote, please uh, give my father back his rights, give my mother uh, back her rights. Those who received the petitions uh, ranged from Stalin, state and party authorities, uh, Molotov, Kalinin, uh, Vodashilov, people who, were, uh, who occupied the uh, top rung of the Soviet uh, leadership. Uh, they received petitions. They had a whole petition bureau so many of the top-ranking uh, Soviet leaders uh, had a receiving room or a uh, letters department, and people wrote, wrote to them. Uh, people wrote to a finance inspector if they were angry about uh, their taxes. Uh, and, the, and Soviet authorities were very serious about these letters. Lenin said, shortly after um, the Civil War, that the fight against bureaucratism would be more uh, difficult than the Civil War. 
uh, and to enlist the masses in this war against bureaucratism and uh, corrupt officials, uh, he created the Worker and, uh, and Peasant Inspectorate. Uh, so important was Rob Crin, or the Worker Peasant Inspectorate, that Lenin's own sister was head of the uh, Complaints Bureau of Rob Crin. So they were very serious about this, uh, and this relates to something uh, Keith said about uh, uh, the GDR. Getting complaints or hearing complaints uh, was also a way that the state gathered information, uh, controlled officials, uh, disciplined officials, and it was also a way for the state to establish, or many of these individuals in the top party leadership, uh, establish their kind of um, magnim magnanimity, magnanimity, as uh, as Keith said, um, because you ex you show your capacity for mercy, you enhance your authority by uh, displaying your capacity for mercy. So for them, this was a very beneficial process, which is why they encouraged it um, uh, for so many years. Now, you would think that if they encouraged it, they would read these letters and they would act on them. Uh, but the bureaucracy was so flooded uh, with letters, particularly once we get into the late 20s, early 30s, where uh, Stalin is depriving people of rights, he's deporting people to the gulag, the gulag takes off at this time. So people have occasion to write. They're desperate. They're writing uh, because it's a matter of you know losing your house, losing your, uh, your parents. So the, the letters just flooded in at this time. And the bureaucracy, the Soviet bureaucracy, could not manage them. There were just way too many. Uh, Rob Crin, for example, the worker peasant in inspectorate, saw an increase, a tenfold increase, just in a three-year period from like 29 to 33. So how, how did they deal with these letters? Well, they moved them around, you know, so, um, so great was the burden of all of these petitions and letters uh, that they said, okay, this is about uh, the courts, we're gonna send it to the uh, procracy. This petition is about housing, we're gonna send it to the housing department. And so the, the petitions moved around as a way, and local officials did this just because they were overwhelmed and they couldn't deal with all of these petitions. So uh, they passed the buck, they moved the letters around. Now, one of the ways that letters moved around was they moved down. So if you had a problem with a local official, which, Soviet, which the Soviet regime wanted you to report, and you sent that letter to Stalin or to Stalin's office, Stalin's office sent it to, their, to the next rung on the party ladder, and they sent it down, and they sent it down, and then it would land in the hands of the person about whom you complained. And so that person would say, would uh, deprive you of rights, would arrest you, would find a reason to punish you. Uh, so complaining was, was empowering on the one hand, but it was also uh, really risky for uh, those who write. So when you wrote these letters, there was a there was an element of uncertainty and indeterminacy uh, in this whole process. It wasn't entirely clear what the outcome would be. Uh, they hoped, you know, petitioners, writers hoped for a positive outcome. Uh, they often got a very uh, negative outcome. So when these petitions kind of went down and landed in the hands of the people about whom uh, the writer had complained, uh, the individuals would be denounced as uh, troublemakers, anti-Soviet uh, elements, um, but my favorite is scribblers, um, pisaki. You know, they were scribblers uh, who had nothing better to do but um, write and write and write. Um, they were often uh, criticized as uh, uh, graphomaniacs. <laughs> so uh, now we get to uh, some of the 
the, the content of these uh, letters and, and what people said and how they wrote, how they stylized their petitions. Um, Alkis mentioned that, that there was a whole process of petitioning which involved um, the writers, those who knew how to formulate petitions. Uh, there was a very, um, a very formal process here as well. Some people turned to lawyers, they turned to those who uh, knew the bureaucracy, knew what, what uh, buttons to push, what things to say. So some of these petitions, when you read them, uh, they're, they're very formulaic. And then others are not at all. Others are uh, highly emotive. Uh, their tragic tales, their ritual laments. So I, I'll talk about these two different styles. If you're deprived of rights, or you've been arrested, or your child or your husband or someone else in your family has uh, been arrested or, or uh, deprived of rights, you might challenge the accusation by describing the individual or yourself as a ideal Soviet citizen and talking about uh, how you're engaged in civic life, how you served the party in this way or that way, um, how you fought during World War II and you have so many war wounds and you made these sacrifices. Uh, so these were kind of the elements of the Soviet self, the formal expected Soviet self. And a number of people wrote in this way. But then there were also what I d thought was a very surprising narrative, autobiographical narrative. It wasn't, I'm a great Soviet citizen, and I've done x, y, and z, and exceeded the plan, and uh, served uh, the trade union, and um, my father's kolkhoz chairman, and so on and so forth. Uh, but it's a, it's a lament. It is vi it, it's highly stylized. It's a tale of hardship. It's a tragic narrative. It talks about pain and suffering. Uh, it, it describes exploitation, poverty, uh, illness. It's a lament on a life of continuous suffering and an appeal to end the suffering. Uh, so it's a very uh, emotional appeal. Um, it's very clear where power resides. You know, the petitioner is powerless. Uh, the Soviet authority is powerful. Um, uh, but what's evident here, too, is that the question of power is often uh, not entirely um, obvious. So even the lamenters, when they lament, uh, they'll insert a threat. If you don't satisfy my request, if you don't give me uh, what I need, if you don't restore my rights, if you don't bring my mother back from the gulag, uh, and so on, um, I'll kill myself. Or I'll starve to death. And so the laments have embedded in them uh, subtle threats as well. And so there, I think, what we find is something rather surprising where the petitioner kind of turns the tables on uh, the petitioned uh, and says, you better do what I say or. Um, there's also another um, element to these petitions that suggests that the petitioners are a little more powerful than they might uh, appear. And that is um, the denunciation. So I mentioned that Lenin wanted uh, all Soviet citizens to describe um, illegal activity or abuse of power by local uh, Soviet authorities, uh, that this was a big campaign, the big emphasis of the regime. Uh, and so embedded within some of these petitions was a denunciation, uh, was an accusation against another person. So what we find is many of the victims who write asking for a reduced sentence or um, the elimination of a 
uh, a criminal record, um, they are condemning another in the process of declaring their own innocence. Uh, so here we see the cycle of violence kind of um, continuing, and those who participate are the people who were originally uh, victims of uh, violence and persecution. So in this way, uh, we see uh, victims and people writing these letters, writing the petitions, uh, using them uh, to punish those who accuse them or to punish other people and to say, you got the wrong person. You're calling me uh, a bourgeois element, but really I took out that um, that uh, like if you were going to open a shop and you uh, you traded, you engaged in private trade, and you opened up a shop. Well, a lot of a lot of people asked some of their workers to take out the um, the contract or the approval on the store so that their names wouldn't be in there because they would were afraid that Soviet authorities would go after them as having engaged in private trade. So some of the people who petitioned said, you know, I, my name was on that approval, that request, but I wasn't the one who owned the store, who owned the shop. It was somebody else. Hannah Arendt said that uh, many people, that this kind of activity where you're, you're saying that um, th this form of repression is okay, but I should be made an exception, um, that what that does is that's an implicit recognition of the rule, uh, and it spells death for all non-special cases. And we see this uh, when we look at the disenfranchised and how they argued uh, for their own special, um, their own special case. So I'll end with uh, a quote by uh, Nadezhda Mandelstam. Uh, she wrote, which one of us has never written letters to the supreme powers? As she wrote this in her memoir. Addressed to the most uh, metallic of names. And what is such a letter but a plea for a miracle? If they are preserved, these mountains of letters will be a veritable treasure trove for historians. The life of our times is recorded in them far more faithfully than in any other form of writing, since they speak of all the hurts, humiliations, blows, pitfalls, and traps of our existence. But to go through them all and sift out the tiny trains of real fact would be a Herculean labor. The trouble is that even in these letters, we observe the special style of Soviet polite parlance, speaking of our misfortunes in the language of newspaper editorials. But even a cursory look at these letters to the powers that be would show at once how much we need miracles. To live without them was impossible, yet the only good life is one in which there is no need for miracles. We'll end with that. Thank you.